welcome you this morning to St. James Presbyterian Church. We're very glad that you're here. Please find the friendship pads, which are located in the center of each aisle. Sign them and pass them to those seated near you. And at the end of our service today, please do take the time to greet your brothers and sisters in Christ. We do have child care available following the children's message today. If you are in need of that, a child care provider will be at the back of the sanctuary and will meet any children who are going out to uh, be watched uh, at that time. I should also let you know that this morning, as I was um, thinking about the way this service was coming together, I did something I haven't done before here, which is print out an insert just a few minutes before worship. Um, Almost all of you have that insert in your bulletin. It's a poem that I'll be reading as part of the sermon. If you were perhaps attending the adult Sunday school class, you may have missed that insert. If you need a copy of it, please raise your hand, and one of the ushers will come to you and give you a copy of that insert. So I see um, one hand up here. In addition, we have a session meeting today. That session meeting will begin at noon with lunch right here in the Horizon Room, and we'll continue with our regular meeting. We have a Pulse due date this week in preparation for our August newsletter. We invite you to respond to Natasha and let her know of any articles that you'd like to have included in the monthly newsletter. The Bellingham Pride Festival will take place today, and we certainly invite your participation. We will have a table there to encourage those in attendance to think about uh, the church community, the greater church community and our church community in particular as being supportive of the pride cause. And also, Undy Sunday is today, so Carla has something for us. Okay, Christian. Thank you. <laughs> Thought it was on. So what part didn't you get? The horizon room. That's where the new underwear goes for the people who are homeless in Bellingham. It'll be distributed at a Homeless Connect event later this month. And you're welcome to bring it this Sunday and next Sunday. I think that's everything. Thank you. At this time, let us still our minds and open our hearts. Let us prepare ourselves to worship God.
Will you please rise for the call to worship, if you're able. In your wisdom, O God, you call us here to worship you. You call us to be fully alive with your life abundant, ready to listen and respond with heart, soul, strength, and mind. You call us to be always watchful for your word of wisdom, sometimes startling and unexpected, sometimes quiet and still, but always dwelling among us. We watch and wait for the Lord of God. Our opening hymn is number 679 in the Glory to God hymn book, Let the Whole Creation Cry. God's word assures us if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. In humility and faith, let us confess our sin to God, first in a moment of silent personal confession. Let us join in the unison reading. Forgive us our sins, O Lord. Forgive us the sin of our youth and the sins of our age, the sins of our soul and the sins of our body, our secret and our whispering sins, our presumptuous and our careless sins, the sins we have done to please ourselves and the sins we have done to please others. Forgive us the sins that we know and the sins that we know not. Forgive them, O Lord. Forgive them all because you are free. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. God, the creator, brings you new life, forgives and redeems you. Take hold of this forgiveness and live your life in the spirit of Jesus. Amen.
seated. At this time, I'd like to invite any children who are worshiping with us to come forward for the children's message. Together, let us sing. pretty young, aren't we? I mean, you all who are there and and me standing here, you're six, so you say, nope, not so young anymore, huh? Is that what you're telling me? You're six, you're not young. Turning nine, not young. But in in the grand scheme of things, right, when we think about how old someone can be, we recently had someone in the church who was 104 years old before she died. That is quite old, isn't it? I mean, that's a lot older than six or about to be nine or any age that that a lot of us are here today. So there's a a great scope of ages. I want to tell you about being a little bit older today. Not that I know from experience, of course, but just from what I've witnessed. What I've witnessed with other people that I've grown to know and love and to respect And one of the things that's true about older people is that they've had a lot of life experience, haven't they? People who are older than us have had all kinds of ways of learning and growing over the years. And they have been through things that a lot of us have not. To be one who has had a lot of experiences is often said to be wise. And when you are wise... That means that other people can look up to you and learn from you because you have things to say that are of great value. Today, we're talking about being wise in worship today, and we're also talking about what it means to grow older and how we can look at people who have all these experiences with admiration and respect and with appreciation. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Let us pray. Please bow your head with me. Let's pray. Dear God, We thank you for the wisdom, the knowledge, the insight that we can learn from those who are older than us. We thank you for the many experiences that have made them wise and for the lessons that they still have to learn and to teach. Help us to be good listeners, good learners, people who want to gain in your wisdom. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thanks for coming forward. You may go to your class. A few weeks ago, we heard from John Seibold, who's a member of this congregation. This week, he's going to be talking to us again. This time, the topic is aging gracefully. Really, God? visit with you a little bit more. Um, Last time when we spoke, I talked a lot about laughing at yourself and how important that is for us as Christians. And I want to talk a little bit about how aging is an extension of that, and you have to learn how to laugh at yourself. So I don't know if anybody's looked at their high school picture lately. Anybody in this room look look at their high school picture? I have recently, and I looked at it, and I went, who is that? What happened? So how do you think this all occurred, this whole aging? Well, in my conversations with God, I've uh, been asking that question. And apparently, when they had gotten done, there was a team, and they had designed all the animals on Earth. They thought, well, we've got to go ahead and design somebody who's going to sort of be in charge on Earth. And that was the human, human, us. So we've got to make the human pretty smart, right? We have to make sure that they don't get eaten up by all the rest of the animals to learn how to do things, but they were a little concerned that this intelligent being might get kind of full of themselves. 
So the design team in working with God decided that to build in some fragility and some obsolescence. And so there's aging. Now, here we are today, gray hair, glasses, some wrinkles, and we're aging. And our population is aging also. But it's not all bad, but I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the frustrations I have with aging today. And hopefully, if you want to laugh out loud or even want to say, "Uh uh-huh, I understand what you're talking about, feel uh, more than uh, free to do that. Um, So one of the things that I've noticed in the baby boomers, um, we're all kind of vain. So my sister, who lives in Newport Beach, California, you know about Newport Beach, California. Everybody looks fabulous. They have a lot of work done, plastic surgery. And I thought about having some plastic surgery done, but we live in Bellingham, and I wasn't so sure about the doctors up here. So I was kind of thinking about it, you know, should I have it done? Because I was worried that I'd end up looking like Donald Trump, and then nobody would work on my house. Okay? The other thing is we love our exercise. Baby boomers were obsessed with our exercise because we want to live longer, right? We want to feel good. And I'm a jogger, and I do all kinds of stuff, but I've noticed lately that when I'm jogging, for one thing, I have to wear my glasses. The other thing is as I jog, I jog one way, but all the jiggly stuff jogs another way, and then about 20 minutes later, we all kind of come together. I also like to play tennis, and um, I play with a group. We're all about the same age, and we all have kind of the aches and pains of, of growing older. So I have to wear a back brace, I wear a tennis elbow brace, and I wear a wrist brace, and I wear a knee brace when I play tennis. It doesn't look good. I'm telling you, it's not very graceful, all these things that start to happen to you as as you do get older. Well, one of the things that's real frustrating, and because it's Undie Sunday, kind of push the limit here a little bit in church, um, getting dressed is a total pain people ask me why I'm late for church is because I can't just jump out of bed anymore and just go. It takes a while. It takes me a while. So uh, you may call this yourself, but when you're bending over to like tie your shoes now, right? You're like sitting down and you're bending over to tie your shoes, your back hurts. So once I get down there, it usually takes about 10 minutes for me to get up. And that's when I do my prayer. I I can get through the whole family tree in that 10 minutes. And, uh, and then I, it up. So, okay, now I'm going to talk a little bit about one of the things that may be a little kind of, you know, tongue in cheek here, but, um, you know, it's Sunday, Sunday. How do I get on those boxer shorts? As I get older, I have boxer shorts and I have to try and figure out how to get those things on. So I have three methods. First of all, I just don't jump out of bed anymore. I roll out of bed. So I keep my boxer shorts underneath the bed because it's at eye level when I get up. And so I have, I, have the, I have the methods. The first method is called the hippity hop method. And the hippity hop method is to take the um, boxer shorts and you put one leg in. Now, you guys are smiling because you know what I'm talking about, right? And you hippity hop as you try and get the other leg in. So it, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. The second method, um, which is pretty good, is um, lay them out on the floor and then I call it the jump in method. And you just jump in, and you're there. But sometimes you put both legs in the wrong place, and so you pull them up, and you're, it's, it's, not, it's very frustrating. Then there's the third method, and we call that the aerobic method. And I do this with the door locked, and that is lay on the bed and pull the boxer shirts over your feet up in the air, and you get them on, right? It works. But last time when I did that, I walked downstairs, and my partner said, uh, I think you have your... Uh, boxer shirts on backwards. I looked around and of course I had them on backwards. So now my final thing that I do is I call it the sit and scoot method and it seems to be the one that works every time and that is to sit on the floor and scoot on in and I did that this morning and I walked downstairs and he says you know you have your boxer shirts on inside out and I said I don't care. I don't care. So uh, we try and make fun of these things. I'm, you know, sometimes when I think about the whole idea of bringing the undies in and the underwear, you think, that was a real design flaw. I mean, I don't understand what they were doing when they were thinking about that. So I like getting older. I really do like getting older. There's a couple of things I like about getting older. One is, as John said, we're much wiser. We're much wiser. And um, it's graceful to be wiser. I think so. 
Um, we don't get worked up over stuff. We're very patient about things that we do. Um, and I think God wants us to be patient. I think as you get older, I mean, we talked a little bit about sin in youth. I think as you get older, um, you're just a, you're a little bit more elegant. You, you are more graceful. But one of the things I joke a little bit about with my friends is we control the checkbook as we get older, right? We're, if you have a patriarch or a matriarch, you, you control the checkbook. There's something really great about the checkbook. Now, I also like to kind of have fun with this, and I've talked to the Lord about this because I don't want to be picking on my family or anything, but um, I like to act a little crazy once in a while as I get older because they all think I'm getting the dementia, right? I'm not. My mother used to play this joke, and what she would do is she'd get the credit card out and she'd go on the shopping network, and she'd buy all kinds of crazy stuff, Vegematic, paint by numbers, you know, those things you see on TV and you tumble around send it out to all her in-laws that are in her will. And then that way she would be reminded very quickly who would call first to see how she's doing because they're very concerned that she's out on the shopping network spending all their money. But I'm sending all my uh, money, keeping all my money and giving it to my cat Moses. And I noticed on the um, uh, front of the bulletin this morning that Moses was on the front of the bulletin. And, and, uh, Moses, my cat, I am convinced, is going to live a very, very long life. And, um, and I'm hoping that all of us live long lives, too. So one of the things about aging that I've learned, and I've been kind of tongue-in-cheek today, and, and I don't mean to poke fun, but, um, you know, being graceful at all parts of our life as Christians, I think that some of those common traits about being graceful are important traits that we need to carry throughout our entire life. And I like to think about it as, um, as I age... Obviously, there are things that you have to have that serenity about aging and know that, you know, it's just part of it and you can make it fun and it doesn't have to be a negative thing. And we do get aches and pains, but most people really care about us and most people really love us. And I think that as an example to others, we can change things and we can continue to reach out to people and be an example to other people in our community as we grow older as Christians. So thanks a lot. I hope you enjoyed it. I urge you, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual worship. Would the ushers please come forward?
find your bulletin and join with me in our prayer of dedication. Let us say together, Almighty God, giver of every good and perfect gift, teach us to render to you all that we have and all that we are, that we may praise you, not with our lips only, but with our whole lives, turning the duties, the sorrows, and the joys of all our days into a living sacrifice to you. Through our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Please be seated. Let us pray. Lord God, help us to turn our hearts to you and hear what you will speak. For you speak peace to your people through Christ, our Lord. Amen. So the first lesson this morning is from Psalm 92, verses 12 to 15, and it's on page 549 in your pew Bible. The righteous flourish like the palm tree and grow like a cedar in Lebanon. They are planted in the house of the Lord. They flourish in the courts of our God. In old age, they still produce fruit. They are always green and full of sap, showing that the Lord is upright. He is my rock, and there is no unrighteousness in him. The word of the Lord.
Our second lesson this morning comes to us from Psalm 71. I invite you now to hear the word of God. For you, O Lord, are my hope, my trust, O Lord, from my youth. Upon you I have leaned from my birth. It was you who took me from my mother's womb. My praise is continually of you. I have been like a portent to many, but you are my strong refuge. My mouth is filled with your praise, with your glory all day long. Do not cast me off in the time of old age. Do not forsake me when my strength is spent. But I will hope continually in you and will praise you yet more and more. My mouth will tell of your righteous acts, of your deeds of salvation all day long, though their number is past my knowledge. I will come praising the mighty deeds of the Lord God. I will praise your righteousness, yours alone. O God, from my youth you have taught me, and still I proclaim your wondrous deeds. So even to old age and gray hairs, O God, do not forsake me until I proclaim your might to all the generations to come. Your power and your righteousness, O God, reach the high heavens. You who have done great things, O God, who is like you? The word of the Lord. Ronald Reagan was 73 years old at the time of his televised debate with Walter Mondale in October of 1984. In the midst of those exchanges, Henry Truitt of the Baltimore Sun asked Reagan the following question. You already are the oldest president in history, and some of your staff say that you were already tired following your last encounter with Mr. Mondale. I recall that President Kennedy had to go for days on end with very little sleep during the Cuba Missile Crisis. Is there any doubt in your mind that you would be able to function under such circumstances? After glancing briefly at his notes, Reagan replied, Not at all, Mr. Truitt. And also, I want you to know that I will not be making age an issue in this campaign. I am not going to exploit for political purposes my opponent's youth and inexperience. It was a defining moment in Reagan's sweeping re-election bid. Hillary Clinton is now 67 years old, and a number of people have been directing similar age-related questions to her. And for this reason, I can only imagine the relief within the confines of her own close associates when Bernie Sanders, who is now 73, officially declared his intentions to run for president in the same party. It is curious, though, is it not, that in the Bible there is very little that is to be said about aging. Scripture has a great deal of things uh, to say about other matters. Money, poverty, peace, love, justice, self-restraint. Of course, it does have a few things to say about growing older, and among those is Isaiah's, Isaiah's vision of the future in chapter 65. There he writes, No more shall there be an infant that lives but for a few days, or an old person who does not live out a lifetime. For one who lives a hundred years will be considered a youth, and one who falls short of a hundred years will be considered accursed. Or if we pause to consider for a moment the book of Proverbs, also in the Old Testament, we find this passing of sagely wisdom from one generation to the next. That's the whole scope of that book. It's all geared toward younger people, those who are going to be lifted up and brought up in the ways of the world according to these wise sages who have this knowledge and experience and wisdom to pass along. In chapter 11, the author writes, and I'm 
paraphrasing here, enjoy your youth, but remember that God will hold you accountable for everything that you do, no matter what stage of life that you find yourself in. That's very good advice, is it not? In Scripture, the aged are often portrayed as prominent members of their own families, their extended families. In particular, John mentioned matriarchs or patriarchs. They are bearers of wisdom and tradition, not only of their extended family networks, but also in their greater communities. And at the heart of the Jewish law, we find this instruction to honor your father and your mother. The Bible doesn't exactly say that We ought to respect our elders, as so many of us were taught when we were young. But such a command would have been obvious to all people in an ancient society, an ancient world, at a time and a place where the extended family was of utmost importance and value. I do wonder, though, if Scripture is often silent about aging for another reason. Quite simply, because it was so uncommon at least in comparison to today. There is a scholar named John Dominic Crossan who has written at length and is world-renowned for his work on the movement to try to explore and understand the historical Jesus. Who was Jesus as a person? Where did he come from? What kind of life did he lead? What can be attributed to him and to his work and to his ministry? He writes that... In first century Palestine, males most likely lived on average just 29 years. That really puts things into perspective, doesn't it? As we talk about Jesus being 30 when he began his earthly ministry and that that ministry only lasted a few years, perhaps. Surely, I imagine that infant mortality rates had a great deal to do with this 29-year Uh, average of life for a male in first century Palestine. But more than that, I imagine that people of every age perished in great numbers from diseases and illnesses that today we would call very common and very treatable and very curable in our age. In other words, what was an ancient person to say about aging when the reality of aging was far from universal? I imagine that for many, the thought of growing old would have seemed like little more than a fleeting fantasy. And having said this, I certainly don't mean to imply that we are now witnessing the fulfillment of Isaiah's vision, where there will no more be a person who does not live out a lifetime. I am aware, of course, of a number of heartbreaking stories, even within this congregation, of people who had to say goodbye to their children far too soon. I think about my own family as well. My parents welcomed a sister four years before me and then endured the pain and suffering of her loss at one week old due to congestive heart failure. Such pain is too deep for me to even imagine. And yet, as a society, most of us are living longer, which offers a complicated mixture of joys and challenges. There is, as you might expect, more wisdom and more experience to impart. But there is also a prevalence of extended illness, which often presents itself through the prolonged deterioration of the body and the mind. Both of our lessons this morning come to us from the Old Testament, They're both from the book of Psalms. And at their core, each of these passages call us to trust in God. And to do this despite the adversity which is all around us, no matter what our age, but particularly in advancing years. Psalm 92 says, The righteous flourish. In old age, they still produce fruit. And in Psalm 71, we hear these words, As for me... I will always have hope. I will praise you more and more. My mouth will tell of your righteousness, of your salvation all day long, though I know not its measure. Even when I am old and gray, do not forsake me, O God, till I declare your power to the next generation, your might to all who are to come. Your righteousness reaches the skies, O God, you who have done great things. Who, O God, is like you? 
Finally, I'll leave you this morning with the work of an acclaimed poet named Mary Ann Moore. She wrote the following poem in 1941, and as I mentioned in the announcements this morning, I've inserted a copy of her words into our bulletin so that you can follow along. These are her words. The poem is called, What Are Years? What is our innocence? What is our guilt? All are naked, none are safe. And whence is courage, the unanswered question, the resolute doubt? Dumbly calling, deftly listening, that is misfortune, even death. Encourage others, and in its defeat stirs the soul to be strong. He sees deep and is glad, who accedes to mortality and in his imprisonment rises upon himself as the sea in a chasm, struggling to be free and unable to be. In its surrendering, find its continuing. So he who strongly feels behaves. The very bird grown taller as he sings steals his form straight up. Though he is a captive, his mighty singing says, Satisfaction is a lowly thing. How pure a thing is joy. This is mortality. This is eternity. Moore's point here is that though none of us is perfect, each of us has streaks and weaknesses as well as limitations. Only God knows who we are and what we are. Each of us is naked amid the dangers of this existence. The author defines courage as resolute doubt, or having the ability or the strength of spirit to keep on going even when defeated. To be strong, one must accept their own mortality. One must accept the reality of death and still fight to keep living. In time and with age, we often become more aware of our own mortality. All along, we behave by keeping the ego disciplined. This is the same concept as that of a caged bird who, though held captive in a small space, continues to sing with all his heart. Despite the bird's lack of satisfaction because of his loss of flight and freedom, he still knows joy. In this case, joy is the spiritual strength to keep living despite the difficult circumstances of life. This joyous discipline is mortality. It is the knowledge of death and at the same time the knowledge of eternity and acute awareness of something beyond mortal existence. So we struggle, yes, but we also persevere. And in the end, we trust. We trust having seen God's presence at every stage of the journey. And so with confidence, we offer our praise and our thanksgiving, secure in God's sustaining care. This is the cycle of life, the cycle of faith. May it be so. And all thanks be to God both now and forever. Amen. Please stand as you are able and let us affirm together our faith is printed in our bulletin. As God's creatures, we are made in God's image to represent God on earth and to live in loving communion with God. By sovereign appointment, we are earth keepers and caretakers, loving our neighbor, tending the creation, and meeting our needs. God uses our skills in the unfolding and well-being of this world. Male and female, all of us are to represent God as we do our tasks. Whether single or married, we are called to live within God's order in lives of loving service. No matter what our age or race or color, we are the human family together, for the Creator made us all. Please remain standing and let us sing together. Rejoice the 
be seated. I'll begin by giving you a few updates from what I announced last Sunday at this time. First of all, Katie Reed is recovering from heart surgery. She is now at home but is not yet strong enough to receive visitors. She appreciates your prayers, your thoughts, and of course your thoughts about her well-being. So uh, we think about Bill today, about Katie, about uh, their family and the uh, difficult, slow process of recovering from a surgery like this. In addition, I mentioned that Helen Oliver Lean died aged 104. Um, Her daughter, Marion, was going to meet with me last week to plan the service, and she ended up having to go to the hospital. So I don't yet have a date for that service. As soon as I know more, I will share that with you. And finally, B. Albert on hospice care, I have no additional information for you about her condition. Everything seems to be uh, basically stable at this time as she thinks uh, about what is next and entering into eternal life. Finally, um, from Joe McClid, prayers are asked for my sister, Mary Gibbons, who recently had a stroke. Please uh, let us bow our heads together and offer these morning prayers. What follows is based on a prayer from Lloyd Casson. O God, the giver of life, we give you thanks and praise for every season of life. For the nurturing springtime of birth and childhood. For its times of sweet innocence and wide-eyed discovery. For the gift of play and laughter and tears and for the endless hope. We praise you, Lord God. For the busy summer of adult years, for the privilege of creating and nurturing, and for the hard lessons, the joys and sorrows, the pain and fulfillment which this season always brings, we praise you, Lord God. For the brilliance of the autumn season, for fruitful harvest from past labor, for the sense of new beauty, capacity, and opportunity amidst the anxiety of falling leaves. We praise you, Lord God. And, O God, we give thanks for the shorter days of the winter years, the burdens and joys which they bring, for the longer nights for remembering, the loving support from others, for increased vision and wisdom in spite of diminished strength, and for high hopes for the next spring and new life in your eternal presence, we praise you, Lord. Eternal God, whom our words may cradle but never contain, we thank you for all the sound and silence and color and symbol that through the centuries have helped the worship of your church to be relevant and real. Here we pause to remember those who have helped us to come to faith, by singing us songs or telling us stories, by inviting us in when we felt distant, by praying for us without being asked. Jesus, Son of God among us, hear our prayer. We remember those who encourage people to praise you outside the sanctuary. 
those who teach young children, those who lead youth groups, those who offer prayers in hospitals, in schools, in prisons. Jesus, Son of God among us, hear our prayer. We remember people who cannot pray and who struggle to believe, or who fear changes in the church more than in any other area of their lives. We pray that they might be encouraged and that love might dispel fear. Jesus, Son of God among us, hear our prayer. and Let us pray for the renewal of the church beginning with ourselves. Reshape us, good Lord, until in generosity, in faith, and in expectation that the best is yet to come. We are truly Christ-like. Make us passionate followers of Jesus rather than passive supporters. Make our churches communities of radical discipline and signposts to heaven. Then in us, through us, and if need be, despite us, let your kingdom come. We pray silently. Finally, together as the people of God, we offer the prayer that Christ taught us as printed in our bulletin, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Please stand one last time as you are able for the singing of our closing hymn. Bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. 
the Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. May the peace of Christ be with you. Let us share signs of God's peace.